video is going to look at polysaccharides, which are large molecules made from many repeated units of monosaccharides, or sugar, single sugar units. Polysaccharides, as I just mentioned, are made from many repeated units of monosaccharides. These join together by a process known as condensation, whereby two hydroxyl groups are used to remove a molecule of water. You can see you've got two H's and an O. The oxygen that's attached to the hydrogen in this hydroxyl group, the bond breaks there, leaving a free bond on the oxygen to join it with the free bond on the adjacent monosaccharide. They join together and that's known as a glycosidic bond, kind of the linker that joins the monosaccharides together. This happens thousands of times in some cases for polysaccharides to create a really, really long chain of these repeated units joined by glycosidic bonds. This is the first example that you need to know about. Uh, this is starch. I'm sure you've all heard of starch before, finding things like potatoes. Um, and there's a particular type of starch we need to know about, which is called amylose. There are other types, like amylopectin, but amylose is the one we need to know about. Hopefully from the diagram you can work out that the monosaccharide that's used to build this up is alpha-glucose. It's made from many repeated alpha-glucoses joined together by glycosidic bonds. So each alpha-glucose in the chain is joined by glycosidic bonds. This forms a helical structure. You are expected to know about the features of amylose that make it a really good storage molecule. So it's a storage molecule for the for glucose. So it's made of lots of uh, lots of glucose uh, monomers, which can then be used in respiration uh, to to release energy for the plant. So what makes it such a good storage molecule? It's helical, so that's a structural feature. We saw it's got that helix. And this makes it compact, so you can store lots of alpha glucose in a small space. It's insoluble, so it doesn't affect the water potential of plant cells. So if you're storing glucose, this would affect the water potential, lowering the water potential inside the cell if you're storing it as glucose, which will have terrible consequences for the plant. So it's insoluble, so it doesn't affect the water potential. It's large, so it can't exit by itself through diffusion out of the cell. So it can, if you want to store it, it actually stays inside the cell. And it's unbranched. This isn't necessarily such an advantage um, for starch, but it means that it's quite a slow-release source of alpha-glucose storage. The next polysaccharide is glycogen. Glycogen is the energy store for the glucose store in animals and fungi. As you can see it looks quite different overall to the starch that we saw, the amylose we saw before. It is made from alpha glucose monomers again, so we've got five in, in here but again there could be thousands of alpha glucoses in the polysaccharide. Um, the main difference you got them is that you've got branches, so you've got the main part of the glycogen molecule running along and every so often you've got a branch sticking up so the, car the carbon that's a kind of the that's carbon number six is joined to carbon number one forming a branch so you've got the alpha one four glycosidic bonds running through the main part and you've got one alpha one six forming the branches this is kind of an overall diagram of what a glycogen might look like so highly branched um, again quite compact. So very very similar to starch in the properties of glycogen you make it a good storage carbohydrate. It's not helical but it's branched again making it compact so you can store large amounts of alpha glucose in a small space. Again it's insoluble so it doesn't affect the water potential of it says plant cells there's a bit of an error should be of animal cells or, or fungi cells. Um, Large again, so the molecule can't exit the cell by diffusion, so it can act as a storage, it can store it in the cell without it escaping. But this time we've got extensive bran extensive branching. You've got more free ends for enzymes to break off the alpha glucose molecules by hydrolysis. So you've got more availability of glucose in a shorter space of time. So increased rates of respiration can be used compared to 
uh, breaking glucose from, glyc from starch. This is cellulose, which is the final polysaccharide you're expected to know about. Um, quite different to the other two. It's not a glucose storage molecule, it's not an, an energy store. It's quite a different role, uh, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, so the monomer, rather than alpha glucose, is beta glucose. You can see beta glucose here. Remember, the hydroxyl group is pointing up on carbon one rather than down. This means that you have these kind of alternating by 180 degrees each time the monomers. So the beta glucose, you've got one where this group's up, one where this group's down, then up, then down. So they're rotated 180 degrees each time. This creates a really long straight chain. Because you've got these long straight chains of cellulose, you can actually join the chains together by hydrogen bonds. You can see here you've got lots of hydrogen bonding uh, between the chains. This means that as each chain's held onto each other, it makes the molecule very strong. So this would be kind of a formed a microfibril. So you have long straight parallel chains joined by hydrogen bonding. When they join together by hydrogen bonding, they lie on top of each other. This creates what's called a fibril. So a microfibril. So here we've got the uh, features of cellulose that make it an ideal carbohydrate store, structural carbohydrate uh, in plants. It's insoluble. But the main thing, the main thing, is it's rigid. That prevents osmotic lysis. So it allows plants to, uh, that don't have bark to stand upright. It allows things like leaves uh, not to wilt and to stay um, sort of flat and to seem to defy gravity. So this, the cells act like building blocks, like Lego bricks, rather than floppy sponges. So it allows the cells to push against each other and keep the plant firm. Um, so the cells don't burst when they're full of water. So rigid to prevent osmotic lysis, and this is due to the parallel chains joined by hydrogen bonds, forming microfibrils, and again the third feature, got high tensile strength, so that helps to prevent osmotic lysis. The cellulose is found inside the cell wall of a plant cell, so the out, this outside bit that's shaded. You can see here with a microscope that it actually forms like rope-like structures, and this is made from fibrils which is made from lots of microfibrils, which are those parallel cellulose chains joined by hydrogen bonds. So these rope-like structures, very, very, very high tensile strength, preventing the cells from bursting when full of water. 